to your eyes. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Roll call, please. President Van Portley. Here. President Pro Tem Narsh. Here. Council Member Hobbs. Here. Council Member Lamb. Here. Council Member Luxinger. Here. Council Member Matheson. Here. Council Member Rutt. Here. President Van Porfley, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Presentations this evening on a new published agenda. It has none, but uh, we do not have one from Main Street, Oakland County as well. I put those on the wrong agenda. That's why I had to amend the agenda. Thank you. We have none. They're going to be here in August. Thank you. Item five, call to the public. We would like to ask that you limit your comments to five minutes. And it's for non-agenda items. And is there anybody that would like to step up for the call to the public? Thank you, sir. Please come up, state your name and address. working? Nope. Okay. I'm George Dandelitis. Um, I live at 226 Bellevue and I'm here on behalf of Lola, the Lake Orion Lake Association. And the topic is the uh, deep, uh, deep water draw for this year. Um, where I'm going to land is we're requesting the village council to approve going forward with dropping lake level three feet um, and to file a permit with the DNR to do so. So I think everybody knows that we've typically done that every five years, done the deep drawdown. Um, that's been going on since 1991. Um, our next opportunity, the fifth year, is, is this year. Um, we have canvassed um, in our membership drive the uh, Lake Orion um, residents, the Lake Orion actually on, on the lake residents, as we typically do. Um, on our questionnaire in that drive, we asked about uh, whether they're in favor of or, or opposed to the deep water draw. Um, we received 100, 105 responses back in that survey. 84 of those 105 um, were positive in support of the deep drawdown. There were six that were opposed, um, six out of the 105, and then uh, 11 not sure, and then four that just left that blank. Um, so we feel that statistically um, that really supports the deep water draw uh, for this year. Um, we know that there's a concern for using the old pipe that's routed through a downtown building and that we feel that's a valid concern. Um, we feel that there's a, 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 a possible um, contingency method of still using that pipe but utilizing the foot drawdown that are available in the dam. So apparently there are some um, flappers or what, I'm not sure exactly what you call them in the dam, but used to lower the water a foot every year. So we feel that using those, there, those flappers in addition to the, the, uh, the deep water pipe um, could be a, a remedy um, that could be a, a back I say uh, 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 in conjunction with the uh, the deep water tube as an alternative. Um, so again, um, we're requesting that the village council act on that and uh, and apply for the permit and and carry that out for this year. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a hot topic for our community, and we just received some new correspondence. I'd like to suggest that we consider it for an agenda item for next meeting and when we can compile the data that we've got, use your data, and then also get the message out there for the general public so they can participate. Okay, well, and we appreciate that. We understand, though, that the, the timing is starting to get, starting to get late. So. I agree, and I apologize. Uh, it's very short. 
Okay, so if I understood right, then this will come up in the next meeting. It'll be on the agenda in the next meeting. Mr. O'Neill. Yes, Mr. President, if that's the pleasure of the village board, we can have that on the next meeting. Do we need to make a motion on that and have it approved at this point, or is it some, just to make a simple request like this, will it work? Well, ultimately, um, you know, we'd follow the council, current council policy that's in uh, review would be to, um, I believe if there's sufficient time given, any one council member can have it added. Sounds like the president just has to have it added. So I'd, I'd like to. Yes. Um, so I don't think you need a vote to ask to have it put on the agenda for consideration of the entire council. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, sir. We'll be back then in, in two weeks and be prepared to support then also. Thank you. It sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Jerry, you may start the clock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My name is Harry Stephen, 311 North Shore. On the subject of drawdown, if there is a reason that it cannot be done that's done by the state, I think we need to know what that reason is. Has there been something that's changed from state statutes that require us to jump through other loops to do the drawdown? Um, back to the lake again. Um, according to a friend of mine telling me we have 300, or excuse me, 903 homes around the lake, uh, and everybody has at least two boats, I think, on the lake, maybe more than that. That means that there are probably over 2,000 boats on this lake that could be all used at once or not. I've done a little research on it, and I found that the standard for the carrying or the density of boat usage is acceptable for one boat for every 10 to 20 acres. Boy, do we ever go over the top on that. Now granted, not all of them are on the lake at the same time, but there are times when they are. And so we have a potential problem on the lake for as far as density. A thing that I was thinking about is those who have boats, they have their MC numbers and they have state registrations. I'm wondering if it would be possible to have a local or a municipal registry on boats and put a sticker on the back, fee or no fee, so it's visible from the lake as to whether somebody is a riparian and people who are riparians would be entitled to these documents. Likewise, people who are in the marinas uh, are a form of riparians, but they don't pay taxes for that, but maybe they could pay a small fee to get this sticker stuck on the back of their boat. The reason for the sticker on the back is it's visible when a boat is moored. If it is not there, then there's a question why. The only way now is to look for the MC number, which you got to get up on somebody's property to look for the number and then come and bother Harold and have him look up the numbers and that. And that's a red tape. If everybody followed those rules, it would be good. Uh, on the way down tonight, I noticed that the parking lot at the corner of Flint and Andrews, uh, Carl Sorowski has a listing for sale. That is a piece of property that is now a parking lot. And it's zoned, according to him, as downtown center. I've never heard of that zoning characteristic as downtown center. Lastly, Oxford is to be congratulated. They just won a $250,000 grant from Consumers Power for their downtown development. Good job, Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken, Anyone else? Ken, Ken, I don't think that microphone's working. No. None of them are. Oh, are they? No. Okay. Yes. Good show. No Chief Rossman, sir. Good evening. Hi, Council. Um, I just thought about um, doing this. Uh, a lot of the officers are not aware that I'm doing this tonight. Um, but I wanted to bring to your uh, attention that we lost one of our members of the police department uh, over a week ago. I'm going to read, I wrote a little something out and I just would like to share it with all of you and the residents of the village of what kind of guy this guy was. We, all, we lost Officer Guy Higgins. He was one of our reserve officers. 
Officer Guy Higgins entered the service with the Lake Oregon Police Department Reserve Officer Program on April 12th, 2017. After successfully completing the Basic Police Reserve uh, Officer Training Academy at Crest, which is at the Auburn Hills Police Academy, as a Reserve Police Officer, Higgins was awarded Badge 926 and has faithfully served the Lake Orion Police Department in the Lake Orion community for six years. Officer Higgins has at all times sought to assist at parades and events and other public safety needs. Over and above what was required, Officer Higgins worked a minimum of about 1,471 hours, volunteered hours, for the village of Lake Orion. Officer Higgins was in, instrumental in equipping the Department Humvee this day I forward to be known as Unit 946. To the delight of the children and adults alike who have seen it at its special events. Therefore, we proudly recognize and thank Reserve Officer Guy Higgins for six years of faithful service with the Lake Orion Police Department. Officer Higgins has continu continually demonstrated a willingness to meet the objectives of the department and provide exceptional service to the residents, businesses, and visitors of Lake Orion, serving with professional and honorable demeanor at all times. Reserve Officer Guy Higgins has brought credit to the department and himself. Officer Higgins was diagnosed approximately a year ago uh, a little over a year ago with a cancer in, the, in his jaw region. He fought valiantly um, off and on, but it took him very quickly. So with, um, with that, I just wanted to express our deep sorrow, um, the loss of one of our family members, and uh, he did an outstanding job for us in the community, and I just wanted to recognize him tonight. I'm trying to kind of explain a little bit about the guy, and uh, he, he was a wonderful human being. So, thank you. Thank you, Chief Rossman. On behalf of the council, we expect our we express our sorrow as well. Our thank yous to the family for his service, and also prayers for the family at this time. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jason Peltier, Oat Soda, also the commissioner of Paint Creek Trailways, uh, uh, representing the village. Um, I apologize for not getting on the presentation uh, docket this evening. I will be brief, and I just want to give you an update on the Tour de Trail event that we held on June 4th. Um, first, thank you very much for allowing us to have the event. It was a true success. Um, we shot and planned for 400 uh, attendees. We didn't get that, but we wanted to create a beginning infrastructure that we could always use for a growing event. Um, our goals were to have a fun and safe event on National Trails Day. We partnered with that. Uh, we wanted to offer engaging information and educational experiences, provide income for the friends of the Pink Creek Trail, and support businesses along the route. We uh, succeeded on almost all of those events, all, all those categories. Uh, we look forward to building on it in the future. One of the best uh, outcomes of the event, um, Lids for Kids were there, and we were able to outfit about 39 youngsters with uh, free uh, helmets so to protect their lids. So of all the, you know, I think that was better even than the money we raised, just getting the helmets on kids' heads. Uh, we raised right now an estimated uh, $2,937.53. Um, that is still a growing number. We still have some shirts and things we are selling and reconciling some other uh, um, income. Um, we look to have this event in the future. We probably will choose a different date other than June 4th. A lot is happening on a Saturday in the beginning of June. But um, I know Main Street Bikes is definitely uh, looking to do something in the future as well. 
I do want to recognize a few of the village uh, businesses that contributed through sponsorship dollars and or services. Haney Farm Bureau, Building, Builders Custom, Cookies and Cream, Main Street Bicycles, The Reared Family, Primetime, Comics, Ed's Broadway Gifts, uh, Heritage Spinning and Weaving, uh, M&B Graphics, Orient Art Center, and uh, the Lake Orion DDA contributed quite a bit. Last but not least, definitely in the village, the Lake Orion DPW. Without uh, any of those people I listed, we wouldn't have been able to uh, uh, have this event. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Any questions for anybody? Uh, I'd just like to say thank you for the successful event. You had 10 other businesses or participants involved. Great community event. <coughs> Look forward to next year. We'll definitely grow it in the future. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much. Have a great night. Yes. Anyone else for call to the public? Non agenda items? We will close the call to the public and move on to the consent agenda. Our consent agenda this evening. Yes, sir, Mr. Lamb. Now I'd like to remove item village office hours from the consent agenda, please. You'd like to pull it for discussion? Mike, can you repeat that please be put in here? Item two. Item two. Mr. Lamb is asked to pull item two village office hours for discussion. I'll read what else is on our consent agenda this evening. Item one is Michigan Homeowner Association Fund, MIHOF, Provider Participation Agreement. Item three would be Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee appointment here in Crane. Item four, Police Department reports from June of this year. Item five, the Director's report from July of this year. Item six, DDA Halloween extravaganza events permit for October 19th of this year. Item seven, Lake Orion Leadership Homecoming Parade for 2022. Item eight, the new foster care 5K run walk for 2022. Item nine, special event, Oktoberfest beer tent, September 9th and 10th, 2022. Item 10, 2022 Mears Retirement Annual Conference. Item 11, Employee Appreciation Dinner. Item 12, Approval of Village Council Regular Meeting Minutes from July 12th. And item 13, Downtown Development Authority, regular meeting minutes from June 14th. And we're going to pull that item two and discuss it after approval of this remaining consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda with the removal of item two. Support. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. And Mr. Lamb, village office hours, sir. I'm familiar with the item. Uh, the village administration is recommending changing the office hours from 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday Thursday through Thursday and being closed on Friday, effective August 1st, 2022. I think that's a great idea, but I would like to um, ask that the, with the approval of this, that the village manager notify the residents of the village of the change, either directly uh, through uh, first class mail or through the promulgation of some type of newsletter um, stating what's going on in the village. I've had 20 calls this week about the drawdown and I think something this important, I don't want to get 20 calls about the village offices were closed on Friday. So if you, I would be happy to move uh, the recommended motion with the addition that the village administration uh, notify the village residents of the change. I'll support. Discussion? Mr. O'Neill? Yes, it's possible. Um, yes, it's possible. I'm thinking that we do water bills and there's a place on water bills to notify them so there isn't an extra cost to the city. Now most everybody will look at their water bill and see how much they have to pay and if we have something 
and there's a, there's a note section, I believe, on all water bills. And if we can just put something on maybe the next couple of water bills, that will save us some cost. But I will check in that to see how we can do that the most efficient way. Sufficient? Thank you. The only thought I had is we just got a water bill, so the next water bill won't come out until October um, for third quarter. Well, that so. would be the first thing I would check in, and that would be yeah. plan B, which would be something else. Can we also uh, post that on the village website? Yes. Yeah. And the front door. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the newspaper. Yeah, newspaper. Could we do that in public uh, notice too? Or in review. All right. yes. The um, reporter that covers your city, we just introduced ourselves. He will be here Wednesday. I already talked with him about doing some type of an item. That'd be an excellent thing to have in the newspaper for a brief I, I think he's taking notes as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> So Orion Review will get behind it and help us get the word out. And uh, thank you, Mr. New. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Support. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> thank you very much. Item seven, approval of the agenda. By order of the president, chair, no matters will be discussed after 1030 unless the council or the board Votes to continue the meeting. I'd like to ask for one change this evening, and I'll be there, Mr. Lamb. I'd like to add consideration and agenda item, uh, add approval of a proclamation for Mr. Joe Young to the council, um, just to see if we could utilize this proclamation this week at his event. And I'd like to add that is, as other items, item four. And Mr. Lamb. I have two items I would ask that uh, they're really not controversial um, to add to the agenda tonight, and they could be brief. Uh, one is I'd like to add the um, some uh, agenda item where you can have a brief discussion on the direction we would like the administration to go with regarding to the study of an ordinance regulating boat capacity on the lake. This is a reoccurring topic. We just briefly discuss whether we should take some action. So I would move to add an agenda item. Um, to have a brief discussion is whether we should take action of any kind or study boat capacity on the lake. So you're making that as a motion? Well, yeah, to add to the agenda, I thought then we have to make a motion, someone second, and we have to vote on it. To add it to the yeah, agenda. Do we have to do yours first and then? Yeah. Each okay. one individually. So, and what's your sixth one, sir? Your, your additional one? Uh, the additional one would be to um, have the same kind of brief discussion about the drawdown. Um, there's been so many calls. I think we should make a decision as to what direction we're going. Not necessarily voting on the drawdown, but voting on whether or not we are going to study the situation, whether we're going to put it off for next year. I would like to make some comments. And um, I'm not asking to take action, I'm asking that we have a brief discussion at the council level about where the administration is going to go with the issue of the drawdown. We have a new village manager. I think he could use a little direction. Those are two items I'd request to be added to the agenda. So we have one additional item for the proclamation uh, consideration for Mr. Joe Young. I'll make that motion. Support. To add to the agenda. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 Opposed? Item five, a ordinance regulating boat capacity discussion. Um, I would make that motion just to have a brief discussion on what direction to advise the administration to proceed on whether we should get involved in the boat capacity. There's been numerous letters, numerous calls. I, I think it's a great discussion, but I, uh, and I'm not opposed to it. I'd just like to see if we could get some information prior. We need to direct them to get some information, so it would be appropriate to have an agenda item directing him to gather the information. That's, that's what the motion would be for. I support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? And then item number six, draw down discussion for 
direction. So I would make the same motion for the drawdown, just so we can issue a direction to the village manager on how to proceed with the what he should do with regard to these recent letters received and the public's cry for the drawdown. I think we should give the administration some direction on how to proceed with that. So my motion would be to have a brief discussion on how we what we would recommend to the village administration. And that would be to set standards because we already have uh, agreed to allow it or have it as an agenda item on the next meeting. Which I think we should have this a little more discussion. Okay. Support. All those in favor, please give aye. 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 Opposed? No. Thank you. Okay. So we've got some agenda items here. We'll move on to public hearing. We have to approve the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. We need to approve the agenda with all the additions. Motion, please. Move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Item eight. Public hearing. Consideration of creation of a commercial rehabilitation district for West Village, 55 West Elizabeth Street. Mr. O'Neill. Yes, I'm going to defer to the city attorney, the village attorney on this one. Mr. President, if I may. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, tonight on uh, the agenda is uh, the public hearing, the first of two, uh, to consider the creation of a commercial rehabilitation district for West Village at 55 West Elizabeth Street. This is the first step to establish whether or not the proposed district meets the statutory requirements for a district. This isn't the approval of the actual certificate of exemption or tax abatement. This is just whether or not it meets the criteria to establish a district. Among those considerations would be uh, whether or not it meets the definition of a commercial property. In this case, multifamily residential use, I think, requires at least five uh, residential units in a multifamily use. Has to be over three acres. This is just over three acres. Um, and some other things uh, that are really <laughs> kind of uh, not really that important, like local unit of government. <laughs> the village is a local unit of government. So basically, you're here to decide whether or not they meet the qualifications of a district, take public comment from the uh, public as to the creation of that district, either for or against. And then uh, we've laid out the uh, process by which it's transmitted to certain other state authorities, uh, approved or denied by those authorities, comes back again for another public hearing before this body for determination of whether or not to issue an actual certificate and how long that certificate would be good for. You have one to 10 year window to consider that certificate. But again, that's a later date. That's not something for discussion really or consideration tonight. Certainly you can discuss it, but really that's not what you're voting on tonight. Whether or not they meet the statutory requirements of a commercial rehabilitation district. If you decide to deny it, that there's, there's two proposed resolutions that will be considered later on in the agenda after the public hearings conducted tonight to uh, you've been presented with both uh, either to approve or deny. Uh, my reading of the law requires a resolution if you deny it uh, to enact a resolution denying it as well as a resolution to, if you decide to approve it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So we have presenters here you'd like to present. Good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of council, uh, members of the public. It's good to see everyone again. Matthew Gibb, my address for the record, Madam Clerk, is 930 uh, Lakewood. Uh, I'm here with uh, Kyle Westberg, uh, Bob Davis, who's uh, one of his operational chiefs, uh, and we're here about West Village. Uh, we're very pleased. I want to applaud the work of uh, your village attorney, not to give an attorney to attorney kudos, but uh, he's been uh, very much on top of the procedural aspects of this and gave an excellent recitation to you of where we're at in the procedure. 
Um, for the benefit of the public, uh, uh, it is our intention and has been our intention as a project developer for this uh, project to move forward with an ask and ask for an exemption certificate um, uh, of 10 years on a commercial rehabilitation uh, tax abatement. Uh, well, we're not at that stage yet. Uh, we have lots of homework to do. Uh, where we're at on the project, and again, mostly for the benefit of the public, and I apologize to the good council members who has heard this um, on a few occasions now. Uh, uh, Westburg Construction, uh, I mean, sorry, West Construction, Kyle Westburg has purchased the property, uh, and so they are the fee owners of the property. This isn't something where we're gambling that we could get some type of an approval. Uh, the group is all in, so to speak. Uh, we have made that commitment to the project um, and have undertaken a significant amount of other steps. We've uh, worked on the engineering, including the work that we uh, has given to you that our work with the school district to make sure that the stormwater retention, the excess parking, uh, all of those items that have been part of the dialogue um, have been significantly moving forward. When we get to the point where we're asking for the actual exemption, uh, we'll go in much more detail about what that means. The, some of the talking uh, that has happened in the village that I'm certainly aware of as to, well, what does it mean for the DDA? And is the DDA too large? Those types of things. We're more than happy to engage on what a project like this does to impact a community. Uh, but for tonight, for the creation of a district, just want to reflect what does it mean from an economic impact to have a district like this within your uh, village? What does it open you up for? It opens you up for the opportunity for you to ask, for you to say to an applicant like ourselves, well, what really is the benefit? What are the public benefits of your exemption certificate? Without creating the district, you of course can't ask us that because there wouldn't be a procedural thing to do. And we of course can't ask you um, for the help. But what are the public benefits? We're clearly intending to rehabilitate a long, uh, uh, unused structure in the community. Uh, as you've all seen, and I've certainly seen over the last um, several months, uh, the vandalism has again started, and we're doing our best to keep that down, but there's graffiti and there's more broken windows. And quite frankly, the quicker we can get this project under construction, the quicker that goes away, and the quicker that that facility really becomes uh, alive again. Uh, that's a benefit to the community. The historic preservation is a benefit to the community. In the materials that you have, one of the biggest things that we project is the level of investment, which is estimated close to $21 million of all-in investment. That means everything loaded to the table, about $21 million in your community. The core investment of the rehabilitation, which would fall somewhere between six and $8 million, would have an immediate impact of 180 to 200 construction jobs. It would have a residual impact of 10 to 15 jobs at the site. And you can anticipate, if it wasn't us asking you for an exemption later, that by creating the district you would open the opportunity for someone else to come and ask you for that, that, that relief, saying, what would you do there? Creating a district simply invites someone to come and ask and, and have the ability to explain. But we know our project will result in those job impacts. They'll also res result in a residual impact. It's very, very um, interesting math and very, very straightforward math to look at when there is an investment of a rehabilitation and historic preservation of certain dollar amounts in a community such as Lake Orion, what is the impact? We know that our impact will likely have upwards of an 18 uh, to $20 million immediate impact over the first two years uh, here. That's the spending power of the residents that would come. That's the spending power of the activity that would be there. The community benefits of the use of the gymnasium that we're gonna have for uses. So this is information the public knows. This is the information that all of you know. As your good attorney has said tonight, um, and I concur, the procedural step is for you to consider um, our application uh, to the village for a three plus acre parcel that meets the criteria of the statute. And if council is inclined, you would say, yeah, we're willing to hear you out at the next step with no promises or guarantees. You'll have to do your homework. Uh, you'll have to come and prove more than what you're talking about tonight, Mr. Gibb, uh, and we're prepared to do that. And so we're here to answer questions about what the district would mean, um, what it means for that property. And I think just to close, I don't need to reiterate the, um, uh, the pathway that that this group has taken to try to make this project a reality. Uh, the state of Michigan continues to uh, uh, build but struggle with the administration of its economic development programs. A program like this is really in their crosshairs of being an excellent, excellent program for them to support. 
but to do that, as we've said before, the community has to participate in a substantive and substantial way. Uh, we did not choose to do the obsolete property rehabilitation district, which would capture everything. It would capture school taxes and all kinds of taxes. Uh, would also be 12 years. We did not seek to have an extended TIF for this project, meaning we could have looked at MISHTA financing and had a different way to approach the residential, and so we're not looking for a 30-year uh, payment in lieu of taxes agreement. Um, those much more onerous and burdensome techniques were set aside with the idea of we would ask for you to create a district so we could come and explain from a very real standpoint how many years from one to 10 would be appropriate that the state would be satisfied to participate in the many ways that they want to participate um, to make this historic renovation happen. Um, so tonight's the creation of the district and we'll be back and I'll give a similar presentation, but that one will be much more detailed on what the numbers are, what the actual abatement relief would be, with the impact on the DDA, and we're certainly prepared to do that and excited that you might consider this district tonight. And I can answer any questions from the public as they come up, Mr. President, as you allow. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Kevin Breslin, uh, 215 Elizabeth Street. Um, with regard to granting this um, commercial district, what tax burden will this represent for the village, the ex village residents and taxpayers? Do we know? Do not know at this time. Okay. We don't know what the ask is, sir. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Does granting this open the door for other developers to want to come in and do the same thing for more multifamily developments in our residential, primarily residential little village. Are we going to get more apartments and zoning exceptions for high rise buildings? It's, it's a case by case consideration. Accurate council? Correct. Okay. So there's no, no answer. It's to be determined in, in each case. Each case stands on its own. They are not uh, grandfathered in any way by decisions that were made on other cases. And Is that accurate, Council? Correct. And then the determination of what, if any, tax burden this will represent to the village, when will that information be provided? Once we know what the ask is, we should be able to calculate that. And we don't know that yet. It's uh, a negotiable circumstance of one to 10 years, and we don't know what their considerations, what their ask may be at what kind of an amount. And there's an annual review each year to make sure that they remain in compliance with the criteria that goes along with the um, granting of the uh, creation of the commercial rehabilita rehabil rehabilitation district and if they were to fault at any one of those, in any one of those years with not providing uh, the number of jobs that they promised they would do, things like that, then it can be rescinded. Accurate counsel? Absolutely. And once the determination or an, an estimate of what the tax, potential tax burden may be for the village, will the citizens of the village, uh, taxpayers have an opportunity to be uh, involved in that conversation or is it going to be expedited to a decision? I expect that to be part of the next hearing's discussion. Correct. If council chooses to move forward and establish the district tonight, there'll be a second public hearing where those numbers will be uh, firmed up. <laughs> right now they're just estimates. Uh, and then uh, that'll be part of the next public hearing, which there's some process steps in between there, so it'll be a little while, yeah. Okay, and then lastly, um, what will the, uh, if, if we went with a 10 year period, do we have an idea of what that represents in the form of savings slash profits for the developer by not having to pay the taxes for the 10 year period? Um, we have in our correspondence, uh, this is uh, an example. Uh, the applicant projects that if an eventual commercial rehabilitation exemption certificate is issued by the village, then the current tax of $3,722.57 would be frozen at that amount and that approximately $53,955 
would be abated annually for the term of the certificate. Okay. That's a generalization. Okay. So about a half million dollars ish. Uh, over a period of 10 years. Right. Using those numbers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Stevens, sir. Perry Stevens, 311 North Shore. The Eman Center, which is the core element here, was a building that was built in the mid 1920s. And as we all know, there are problems with buildings from that era that need to be remediated in some fashion. This would be known by the West Corporation when they started the program that this was a known difficult situation that they had to encounter. And they've moved forward. I agree that the Eman Center is part of the rehabilitation aspect. But the main part of the new development is equivalent to a greenfield development. It's naked property that could have been anywhere that the development could put in the number of units that we're talking about. So I think the rehabilitation only applies to the Eman Center, not the entire property. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Dr. Brenton Balow. I own 230 East Elizabeth and the new owner of 54 West Elizabeth. So right across the street from the high school. So I am in support of a, a commercial district, definitely, with one stipulation. Um, and that is, well, truthfully, I'd love a coffee shop or a sandwich shop across the street from my, my new residence. That would be great. But at the same time, the windows are broken, the graffiti's on the wall, something needs to happen. So am I supporting this? Absolutely. At the same time, that new residence I own for three weeks now, it's a racetrack. So I don't know if you guys can do something at that corner, whether it be a roundabout, where it's not a straight shot, a quarter mile straight shot from, from Broadway up to Kroger's, but truthfully, that is the biggest, biggest issue I have. We're already going to get much more traffic with, with the new apartments coming in or condos, and I understand that. Um, do we need the tax base? Absolutely. We need some new roads here. So, yes, we do need that, and I do support it, but please, when you take into your considerations, make sure you do something with that corner, whether it's more stop signs would be an absolute minimum, but truthfully, I'd rather see something with a, a pretty roundabout, a nice concrete barrier in the front that says, Welcome to Lake Orion, where people can't make it a straight shot, and they have to slow down and, and come to almost a stop to get around that corner and head up, head up Kroger. Because it seems like if there's anything going on downtown, Elizabeth to Washington is everybody's get around to get out to Orion Road or the other side of town. But please take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, good evening. Good evening. No, it doesn't work, does it? Good evening. I'm Birgit McQuiston, uh, 440 North Broadway. I didn't know what uh, rehab, rehab, commercial rehab act or uh, designation was, so I did some homework on it. And I'm reading off of a PDF from our state government that says under what requirements for a commercial rehabilitation exemption certificate must be met to gain approval at the local government unit level. And one of those states, the applicant states in writing that the rehabilitation of the qualified facility would not be undertaken without the applicant's receipt of the exemption certificate. That leads me to ask the question, does that oblige you to provide that for them, or does that mean they'll pull out if they don't get it? It's my only question. Thank you. I can't answer that. I don't know. Yes, sir. Greg, Greg McQuiston, 440 North Broadway. I've been listening intently to try to understand what is the advantage to the village of granting this tax exemption? And I've heard job creation, I think. I'm not sure I've heard much else besides that. So I'm not really sure what the village gains in exchange for foregoing the income. Thank you.
Anyone else? Close the, Mr. Well, if, yeah. if I could just answer a couple of the questions, Mr. President, so they're on the record as part of the public hearing. You're welcome. Um, regarding the traffic, and welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, we love Lake Orion, and we're glad to have you uh, at that location. Um, there is, and it's part of the site plans that have been proposed um, to satisfy the parking counts, that there will be um, an improvement to the road, uh, significant improvements, including the parking, which will include very defined um, on-street parking which usually has a very calming effect, but we'll certainly take into account what you're saying about maybe some other design elements that would calm some traffic. Um, uh, as to the question of uh, that Ms. McQuiston, I wouldn't doubt with how smart she is that she would raise the question of um, it is a requirement at the exemption certificate level uh, that uh, uh, if we're not able to get an exemption certificate, we've been very consistent from the beginning. It's extremely hard to finance this because if we can't get some participation from the local level, the state will not participate. And so if the state will not participate, then um, all of the ability to, to put this together financially um, really comes apart. Uh, and so we've been very consistent, Mr. President and members of council. And that is in no way obligating you. It's not, it, it always seems like it is. It's like, oh, it's this or else. Um, it's the reality of this type of, of project. And then let me just see that real quick. Uh, just in case these answer some of the other uh, questions, I know um, Mr. McQuiston asked about, uh, well, what is the village really getting out of it? Um, the, the rehabilitation and preservation of a 1926 school building, um, uh, the use of the rear ball fields um, for additional residential development within the community um, is a real significant factor. It's, um, as we've represented all along, that without creating um, a district of this nature and considering some form of an exemption certificate. Um, many have tried uh, and uh, it would be extremely difficult to rehabilitate that property um, at all uh, in, the, in the way that it sits. Um, improvements to the, the public uh, parking lot areas, uh, the bus stop on Elizabeth Street, new landscaping, lighting and uh, paving, converting the school gym to the court at West Village, um, where events and making uh, dates available for annual use by the village and the DDA, uh, the streetscape along the Pier Street, wayfinding signage and others, um, installation of historic markers, enhancement of the streetscape. So all those things will be have been presented in the past and just want to reiterate them for the record that well, what would be the benefit of creating a district? Whether it's us or someone else, I would hope that those are some of the committed benefits. You would create a district so that someone would come in and present to you, here's why we need the numbers, here's why we need this additional financial assistance on the 20 to $21 million package, here's why the state won't participate if we can't do that. Oh, and by the way, here are the significant enhanced benefits for rehabilitating this project. So I just wanted to add that to the record, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Has everybody had their opportunity? We'll close the public hearing at this time. Thank you very much, everyone. Moving on to item nine, agenda items for consideration, financial matters. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. We have uh, one adjustment on the bills to be paid. It's on the Parks and Recreation Contractual services, the recording secretary, if that is in the wrong place, it's the second time in a row. And it, the wrong number was transposed, and that will be corrected. Can you tell me which account it's supposed to be in? Uh, what it's supposed to be in? Yeah, 721. 721. 721. So does that Why change? the planning commission secretary. Yep. The recommended motion stays the same? Yes. Entertain a motion. I move. Support. Any other additional challenges, discussion? Roll call, please. Hobbs? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Luxinger? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Van Portley? Yes. 
Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Moving on to B, other items, item one. Consideration of creation of a commercial rehabilitation district for West Village, 55 West Elizabeth Street. Mr. Go ahead. I was going to let Mr. O'Neill, if he had anything he wanted to say, we've got the background brief before us, and I believe we did we didn't read it or cover it prior to the presentation. No. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Mr. Any additional President. comment from council on this item? For well, I just, if I may, Mr. President. Yes, sir. I just wanted to direct council's attention that those numbers are purely estimates provided in the application that was submitted some time ago, subject to change. A lot of the good conversations, questions uh, about benefit to the public in the village um, and those types of things are all appropriately considered at the next public hearing for creation of the actual certificate or granting of a certificate if this board cho chooses to do so. Right now, the focus is on whether or not it meets the statutory requirements. And I listed some in the initial conversation earlier. Uh, the other one was, uh, does it meet the definition of rehabilitation, meaning uh, changes to a qualified facility that are required to restore or modify the property together with all appurtenances to an economically efficient condition. So those are the, the things you'd be looking at. Uh, if I'm happy to answer any questions about what those, but my legal review of it appears that the applicant on its face meets the qualifications for creation of a district under the statute. So that being the uh, I move to approve to adopt resolution 2022-032 establishing a commercial rehabilitation district number two for West Village located at 55 West Elizabeth Street, Village of Victoria, Michigan, pursuant to Michigan Public Act 210 of 2000. Support. Discussion? Mr. Lamb. Somebody has to talk. So I, I don't want to, I don't recommend approval of this at all. I, I see no benefit to any tax abatements for any projects within the village. We have another developer who's going to do 60 million. He's not asking for any tax abatements or special requirements. Uh, considering the financial status of the village and having no money for infrastructure. Um, my wife can't walk down our road because the pavement condition is so poor. My understanding is there's, is it $6 million in failing pump stations on the island? And uh, there's also $6 million of water main uh, rehabilitation uh, still left to do. And it's yet to hear from anyone on the council as to where any money will be coming for any of these necessary municipal improvements. Needless to say, so my direction is not tax abatement. Perhaps we need to increase the taxes on the commercial property. Because of the heavy burden, hundreds of extra apartments are going to put on the community. My understanding is this is going to be some kind of brownfield redevelopment. We we're going to get some money from the county to clean up the asbestos, but now we're asked for a direct tax abatement against the community. So um, my comments are I'm going to vote no on any tax abatements in the village of Lake Orion that I'm involved with. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I th believe that we've had multiple opportunities or developers come before us on this piece of property and nothing has come forward as an end result and this firm uh, is intent, they've already purchased the property, they're intent on going forward with the best effort that they can have. By approving this tonight, it gives us the opportunity to see and learn what some of the other items are as far as how much, what's the ask, what's the give. This building's been vacant for approximately 35 years. The public has cried out in many cases, do something, save it, work with us, figure it out. 
So by voting on this district establishment tonight, that gives us the opportunity to consider. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Marsh. Yeah, I just want to comment as well. Um, watching that building decompose over the years, um, I liken this almost like uh, you got a car out front of your house. You got to say it sat there for 30 years and nobody's taken it. Nobody's buying it. When somebody comes by and says, "If you knock a thousand off, I'll take it." Um, it what was once a beautiful building has become the blight of the building that you were um, To bring that back to life, Mr. Stephen brought up uh, some valuable points uh, about the rehabilitation costs with the asbestos and other issues inside that building. And as was also brought up, that each of these projects as they come forward, uh, there may be another development where they don't need that because they don't need the state assistance and the state government to come in and help. And we finally have somebody coming in. So I want to hear the numbers, and I want to keep an open mind. And that's for the next meeting. So this purpose is to get us there. And uh, we got somebody kicking the tires, and that old jalopy has been sitting out there for 30 years for the full sale site. Uh, so I'm excited to, to hear. Any other comments? We have a we have support on that motion, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. I'd like to call a, a roll call, please, on the motion that's been presented. Lamb? No. Luck Singer? Yes. Brutt? Yes. Van Portley? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Motion Carry 6 1. Thank you. Item two on this evening's agenda, Green Park Hours. And I'd like to begin this with, uh, you wanna give us a quick brief, Mr. O'Neill? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, um, I've had discussions with members of the board and I believe there's a Parks and Rec meeting tomorrow. And this should, could be something that could be discussed there. Uh, and my haste to put this on the agenda and get those docks installed. Um, I didn't think about stepping on anybody's toes on the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, but my thought process was, if we're going to do this, there may have to be some modification there at Green Park relative to people who want to use the DDA and you bring their boats over there. And dusk to dawn, we know that uh, some people won't even get over to the DDA area until dusk when we have the docks there. So while we want to maximize the use of the docks in Green Park and the DDA, <clears throat> we might have to have some give and take. So I'm not sure, <clears throat> excuse me, what comes first, the chicken or the egg. So I would defer to the board if you wanted to wait and have the, 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 the PNR board take a look at this, give their thoughts on it. Uh, maybe they're all for, I don't know. Um, I'm not looking at drastic changes, but I'm going to looking at some things and talked with uh, Wes today about some things we want to do with the locks on the bathroom. And it's all going to be pop positive for, for Greens Park. It's going to increase the traffic. Um, I didn't realize that there was a permit specifically for that park pass. So, you know, one has to take a look. Do you want to charge them double because they're going to be using the docks? Now they have to pass through the park. So, you know, there has to be some give and take. So with that, I would defer to the board on what you think is best. You want to wait? And we'll, we'll put the docks on anyway. But if you want to wait and have the Parks and Rec Board take a look at this tomorrow <clears throat> at their meeting and put this off to August, there's no, no rush on that. But we'll put the docks in and anyway. Uh, I did not make a motion to adjourn this item to the first meeting in August only because I truly want this to go before Parks and Rec and get some input um, and uh, in, involved in that process. So we'll just move it. 
So, support, Mr. Lamb. So, it, as a positive comment on this issue, you know, during our recent discussions with uh, the Mosheri Corporation, and they have a planned unit development proposed for the property directly adjoining of the park. Uh, during one day, I was able to go with uh, uh, one of the park representatives at the park, and we noticed there were quite a few issues with the park, with the dumpster the fences, uh, access to the new proposed boat docks. And I might uh, ask that we um, suggest to the Parks Commission that they entertain a dialogue um, with Mo Sherry about utilizing, since the PUD is supposed to be utilized for the benefit to the village, um, that we could indeed, instead of having a you know, paved, uh, hand, you know, paved, Mo Sherry's proposing a paved ramp it threw the park for an ambulance from their project. Might I suggest it might be more beneficial um, that he would spend his money on um, items that could address what we've discussed here. And again, that Parks and Recreation meeting is tomorrow night. And I agree, I would like to have that board please offer their suggestions as to what they would like to see. They work very hard with very little money and give us great fruits here in our community. And so I look forward to uh, what the recommendation may be. We have a motion on floor and support. Anybody else? Yes, sir, Mr. Um, O'Neill. Yeah, Mr. President, what I would do is I would prepare a packet for uh, council person so she could take that to the board tomorrow night and have as much complete information as possible. Thank you, sir. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Item three, asset management software, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the council. Uh, you see I have a brief uh, synopsis of what we want to do <laughs> with this. There were some questions asked of me relative to the proprietary use of the information that we would have and whether or not once we develop the information, it would go on these tablets that we wouldn't have a problem uh, with this information and that the company that's hosting wouldn't hold it hostage. With that, I would turn it over to Wes because he's been the point person on this and he has additional information and how they will use this in the field. Good, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, Mr. O'Neill asked me today, you know, about the proprietary, our, our information. Our information will always be our information. If we purchase the software and don't like it in three weeks, three months, three years, 30 years, our software is our software. Our data is our data. Um, we can take it with us to another asset management. Um, currently, when we get five to 15 mystics a day. Um, when somebody does work in the village, they call in misting, any underground digging, okay? So my guys go out there and they mark the water. Um, WRC marks the sewer. When we get out there, we have a book and a binder that says the water stop, stop box is six feet from the fence, four feet from the utility pole. Things change, things move. So what this software will do, it'll digitalize all that, It'll take everything we own, um, and not just for the DPW. It'll work for the police as well. They can do, um, uh, you know, uh, what does Ray do? What does Ray do? Code enforcement. Code enforcement. They can do code enforcement on this. Um, they can, you know, tab what's where and what's not. Um, drop down menus for all of our fire hydrants, our streets, our sidewalks, our light poles. Um, it puts all of our assets in one place where we can pool that data, we know when something's out, something's bad, last time it's been touched. Um, as it sits now, we've had four directors in the last 20 years and everybody had a different filing system. So if you were to ask me right now, when the last time the hydrants were painted, I go in a file and I start searching through paper and then I find a document from the guy who did it in the field with a bunch of chicken scratch on it and whatnot. This just puts it all in one spot. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer. 
Ms. Wright. How long will it take to move all of these records into this software? NOAC and Frost, our engineers, already have it ready. As soon as we say go, um, the representative from this company will start importing it immediately. He will come to the village for two weeks. Um, it's all included. Um, train our guys on the tablets. It's open source, so we will purchase one tablet from them with all the information, but we have our own iPads that we can cloud-based, it's all, you know, we can access it. Um, unlimited users, unlimited cloud space, and limited data. What will be the um, criteria for making sure that it's maintained properly and new data gets put in? That, that is actually the, the easiest the policy. part. The, Go ahead. the easiest part to it. Um, our current GIS, and GIS is pretty much the industry, industry standard. Right? Everybody uses it from sewers to water to light poles, DT, everybody uses GIS. But you almost have to be um, a surveyor to use that pole with that the round thing. This comes with a simple um, geolocating device that attaches to that tablet. Point and click, you bring up your asset, you give it a name, you give it an icon, it inputs it, it geolocates it, and then it's in the system. So we get a new hydrant, we can simply go to it, point, click, it tags it, it puts it in the system, it's ours now. Mr. O'Neill. Yes, uh, one of the things that Wes and I talked about today that, and I was asked by members of this board was, where are we with our sidewalk? And, and walking the sidewalks and finding all that, that's, that's, this is perfect for that. And you find a trapez or whatever, take your picture, geolocate it, put your notes in there and go to the next one. Very good. Mr. Lamb. Uh, I had a question about the old geo pole. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for that? eBay? It's, it's been sitting in the corner of the office for as long as I've been in, and, and before that. I know Jeremy is at the same place. So how old is it? Probably about six years old. Seven six years, years old. old. Maybe older. No, it's are maybe you going to put it up for public auction? Absolutely. Let me know. Okay. I may need one. Okay. I move to uh, Authorize the purchase of an asset management program with an upfront cost not to exceed $7,300 and an annual reoccurring cost of $2,100, which breaks on as follows $2,000 setup fee, $1,500 annual fee, one Apple GPS tablet device, $3,200, a reoccurring data fee of $600, which breaks down to $50 per month for a total of $7,300. Further discussion? Mr. Sanchez, I believe this is going to help improve the performance or the ability of the DPW to do more with their time. Any kind of uh, performa, have you thought about that much? Like there's the initial expense and then it's $2,100 annually after that. But what's the return? I'm sure it's great. What could it possibly be? Like another 20 man hours a month, 10 man hours a month, not having to look through the old uh, record system that, I mean, what might it be? I'll give you an example. Um, a normal Mystic, we go, we locate the water, like I said. We, we paint, spray paint, we do the marks on the road that you guys see. So we spray paint the main, we locate the, the water shut off at the residence, we paint it. Um, one day, and this chat just happens to be Mr. Land. We run North Shore, Chris and I, my foreman the two most senior people here for the DPW. We went to locate a curb stop, two hours. It took us two hours. The book said it was, it was here. We had 15 holes dug in this guy's dirt driveway looking for this stop box. It wasn't where they said it was. Two hours of our time digging. And, and okay. So that case there could have been just a 15 minute, well, 30 minute deal to drive over there pinpoint it and do it as opposed to two hours to try to Correct. determine Mr. Narsh. Yeah, another really cool advantage of this to the Chief of the Police Department of Public Safety is, and I believe this is part of this, is you can actually then uh, geotag and have precise numbers of every traffic control sign in the building. Every sign. So every stop sign, every yield sign, every cell parking here is corner. So as those TCOs are issued, those signs go up and get tagged. Then you have an accurate number of water signage, uh, what they look like. Um, so there's a public safety component in there that's extremely helpful. Because uh, right now, you have to go out and count and do all that stuff. Or 
time you got a question, then they stick it to five. So there's a public safety component as well. As well as that, there's a lot more transparency. Um, we have a lot of accounts in the village. We have accounts at Ace, Home Depot. You know, we, we purchase a lot of, of things to fix things, right? Something breaks, we have to get parts to fix it. With this, we can take a picture of that receipt, put it with that asset. Um, this hydrant's cost us $30 in the last six months, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I talked to the engineers today, the code enforcement thing is new. So it'll have a map of the village and, and you know, if you, it has layers. So you have all your houses. You can, you can see which houses have been in code violation. Click a button, it'll show you red dots where all the, the, the code violations are. So the enforcement officer just needs to drive by those to, to see if they've been addressed. Very good. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor support. Roll call, please. Lug Singer? Yes. Rook? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Item 4 Proclamation consideration for Mr. Cho Young. We have one before us this evening that we'd like to utilize in an upcoming event, and I'd entertain a motion of approval. So moved. Support. Discussion. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Item five. Ordinance regarding boat capacity on Lake Orion. Mr. Lamb, if you would like to open, if you have uh, sure, start I start the discussion as you said, suggest. Sure, I, so I live on North Shore Drive. I have one boat. Um, my neighbors have no boats to two or three boats. I have two neighbors that rent uh, boat slips to, I won't name them, rent boat slips to friends, family members. I have one neighbor who doesn't have a boat and lets a friend park their boat at their dock. Uh, when we go out to the lake, especially during the holidays and things, you'll see that the flotillas, uh, party rafts, and presence of the number on the boats is, it seems like it's doubled in the last 10 years. Um, I'm actually waiting for someone to be injured. Uh, the number of jet skis and um, sports boats has also increased. The sailboats have disappeared, and uh, so there's been a lot of changes. I, so my neighbors have all, you know, said to me, "How is it that we have these several? I'm not going to point fingers again. We have several marinas on the lake that appear to be functioning marinas." And they have, you know, 10 boats, uh, eight boats, uh, nine boats. And they ask me, who regulates these boats? Who regulates the lake? Who controls any of the issues on the lake? And I said, I don't know. I said, I read every ordinance in, in the charter of the village of Lake Orion. There doesn't appear to be any uh, regulations in the village of Lake Orion regarding the lake, other than we can't sell any of our lakefront property without a vote of the public. So that being said, I think just based on public safety, it's, it's time we take some kind of act. Um, I recently read another study where the wake boats generate something like 10 times the effective energy uh, when they come cruising along the shoreline. Um, so I have you know, neighbors with low sea walls or no one at all. And you know, the, so the wake boats are now washing the shore, uh, disrupting people's patios. You know, things of this nature. I uh, ask, is there any regulation regarding boats? And it's like, no, uh, you're, you're entitled to have a boat. Uh, it's your right to have a boat. And uh, so I believe it's time for the, the village to address one important issue is how many boats should be on the lake? Why shouldn't we have an ordinance recommending you can only have so many boats per household? I mean, there's a fixed number of dwelling units on our lake. I, the recent, uh, the Mosheri development, I asked the Mosheri people this evening, were they going to increase the number of docks on their projects? They said yes, we we're going to add nine additional docks for, of course, all three projects. They'll be adding nine additional docks. However, they're going to be totally eliminating 
all boat rental. So as you know, there's quite a boat rental fleet on the weekends that used to come from the marina and still come. So pretty much we're going to have a fully developed lakefront um, in the next two or three years once some of the projects are done. Um, we have an ever-increasing number of boats on the lake. Um, there seems to be no regula regulation. Um, I think we need to investigate who has authority on the lake, do we have authority on the lake, and should we take authority on the lake. So these are just questions. And I think the appropriate uh, person to do that would be the village administration. Um, and I see before me tonight there were uh, dropped off uh, some letters about the, the drawdown, and I've seen letters here about the boats and the wake boats. I've seen people all summer and all winter this year, we've seen a lot of people here. So I, I would recommend that we, we find some direction to take a steady course ahead for the future of the lake. It's really deteriorating. Ms. Washington. Um, I would like to ask the village attorney, um, can we get an update on the Ordinance review process. We had a third party, the Muni Code. Yeah, didn't uh, somebody, from, didn't uh, Ms. Kuchar get back to you on that? You asked that previously. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask you. Yeah, I know. And then maybe there's some uh, sample legislative language that we could look at with regards to boats. Ms. Rock. Yeah, a couple of questions I have. I'm very open to exploring these because I have heard similar complaints and concerns from people who live on the lake. Uh, so would love directions. What, what can we do, what can't we do? Also keep in mind this is a multi-jurisdictional, dual jurisdictional lake. So how do we balance that when there's also the township portion of the lake that our ordinances wouldn't cover? Um, could there be a joint municipal effort? So. Are there other examples of places that have dual jurisdictional lakes that have partnered or maybe have separate ordinances? So that's in the back of my mind too. How do we do that and try to keep it fair for every, all, yeah, all those issues are questions I have to explore with this. Mr. Narsh. So there's a couple of huge moving parts here. Um, there's who owns the surface of the water versus the bottom of the water. We all know Mr. Ruhlman owns the bottom of the water. But the DNR, uh, what is law? What can a local municipality enforce and regulate on inland lakes? The DNR regulates inland lakes. So I, I think the first step is you have to look at what part of regulation does the state play and do they allow local municipality? And that may be an attorney opinion. Uh, the other thing is that's one piece of it. The other discussion was kind of the repairing rights versus the uh, keyhole. Um, the keyholding aspect is people bringing their boats in, park on the dock, placing that up. I'd be curious to know what lawful ability a community would have for a lakefront owner when they purchase that property uh, to be regulated, including are there local ordinances? We, we have about 400 lakes in Oakland County. And a lot of those are local lakes, so it may be easy to contact a lot of the city village managers, township supervisors uh, with lakes. Do they have regulation? What do they have? Um, if you know, if the wheel has been created to see what's out there in Oakland County, I think that would be a great snapshot. Um, it, it, it's all good stuff until you spend, you know, 1.2 on a beautiful home and you want to put in a boat and somebody tells you you can't. So I just want to make sure that there is lawful guidance on what we can and cannot do. Yes, Ms. Washington. And uh, just another suggestion, um, something to research with regards to these really heavyweight boats now. Um, there's tanks, I guess, in these boats that you fill with water to get them even heavier. Well, that would be very easy to regulate, but to say you can have these big boats, but you can't get the tanks full of water because that causes the damage, that causes more weight. And maybe that could be a way that we um, prevent these heavy, heavy boats in our lake that are ruining your neighbor's patios. 
And, and with that micro caveat, there is no law in Michigan on weight loss. Ohio, I think, has one, but. But see, and if we did it like that with the with the tanks, that would be very easy for an officer to get on the boat, see if there's water in the tank or not, and there, there's if, your. If we can. Yeah. We can. My understanding is you can't regulate the boat type, but you can regulate the activity. And we had, it should be somewhere in your uh, to do pile uh, consideration, I believe, was being explored to regulate uh, high wake generation to 200 feet off of shore. Do you recall that? I do. And Mr. President, if I may. Uh -huh. So um, about a year ago, uh, this board adopted by reference the uh, Water Safety Act, which has certain regulations in it. I made a huge note uh, of concern to me is what are the state laws? What are, is is the local municipality preempted from enacting any ordinances regulating the amount of boat traffic on a public lake? Because this isn't a private lake. There's a DNR boat launch. Uh, so those are certain legal questions. Certainly, you need to take into consideration. Um, it's certainly probably not just a problem in this area, but statewide and other states that has heavy boat traffic. Uh, that it's not the first time it's been brought up, but I'm concerned from a legal perspective what your ability locally to enact ordinances may or may not be with regard to that. With regard to wake boats, we did look at that and we couldn't find anything really saying we could or couldn't do that. We can regulate like uh, no, no wake zones. Uh, we can regulate hours of, of, you know, speeds like from like, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can do all sports and wakes and create waves, but there's certain lakes in the area specifically where they have like a no wake period. Uh, so those are things the board can look at. There's a process to go through with the DNR with that because they are involved in that. Uh, I know the DNR um, is the body responsible for approving marinas, so they, we may not be able to regulate those types of things if they have DNR permits. So all good questions, all questions I've been taking notes on to answer from a legal perspective to help you move forward with answering uh, what you can and can't do with regard to local regulation. And if you might look at that, uh, find some examples of dual jurisdiction. That's yeah, fairly that, big. That's going to be another difficult. Be In the past, I mean, our previous uh, ordinance on boat operation speed was adopted by both the township mm -hmm. and the village. So that answers that question. So if there was a, an acceptable policy in the past, we had uh, mutual. Uh, so it was the same language, same everything, same proposal. So, and there's other things that need to be reviewed as well that have been mentioned such as the rental activity. And I was um, made aware, uh, even like with our Lake Street boat ramp, that last year there was a resident that lived there that told me that in, on a daily basis, an outlying marina would bring their boat rentals there and drop them off and pick them up. And so that enters into the question about enforcement as well. And there is a need to greatly improve that, and how do we do it, much as uh, Mr. Stevens had mentioned it, and even the consideration of noise in some regards. But also comes to mind commercial use. And what I mean by that is, is there have been some citizens here that have um, questioned about commercial use on the lake. Right now, there's no permits there's commercial entities out there. There has been a food uh, restaurant in the past that was on a, a floating deck. You've got um, a couple of different commercial considerations happening right now. And that needs to be part of the overall discussion. And I see one person from the public here that would like to add some comments. And um, I'm going to consider this as open discussion. And Jerry, did you have something you'd like to say? Name and address, please. 
My name is Jerry Richards. I live at 535 Indian Wood. I've been on the lake since 1973, and uh, this is not a new issue with people running dock space. We just had our general membership meeting for the Lake Orion Lake Association. Chris Knights is our conservation officer for Oakland County, and the law is very, very clear. You cannot rent your dock space to somebody that does not live at that premises. And they can match the MC numbers up to the property. And they, being the conservation officer, can issue tickets, citation, and it's, it's unlawful to do it. Uh, but you might own three, four, five, maybe six votes, and those can all be at your dock, as long as those MC numbers match up with your property location. This has been a big issue on the lake. We've gotten more and more of these illegal marinas that are popping up. And for anybody that's doing out there, doing it out there in the, on the lake, I would ask them to contact their insurance company and ask them if they're insured for anybody being injured on their property while they're renting them dock space. And I think the answer is gonna be no, you're on your own. And so the money that the people are making renting the dock space may not offset the damages that they might incur if somebody gets injured. And we all know that you can get injured. We don't know when it's gonna happen, but sometime, someplace, some way, it's gonna happen. But, and question, Jerry? Oh, okay. But it was very, very clear to us under uh, the Public Act 301, which is through the DNR, that it's very easy to apply for a marina permit if you choose to do that. But without a marina permit, you are illegal, illegally renting dock space. So just a word to the wise. Some folks are taking notice of this. Some people are getting very upset. Congestion on the lake, I've never seen it any worse than it is right now. Uh, in fact, we did a little poll over at the, at the sandbar. Several of those people over there bragged about the fact, yeah, we don't live on the lake. We rent dock space on the lake. And that just, that just sets the stage right there because the word gets out. And then somebody else says, hey, my neighbor might rent you some dock space, and so on and so forth. So it just keeps manifesting itself. Relative to an ordinance, the uh, vice president of the Michigan Lakes and Streams Association, he's a lawyer, and they have, they have several ordinances that you can point to for controlling your local community. And yes, it's true. The village doesn't own the water, the village doesn't regulate the water, but you certainly regulate the land use and the dock attached to your land with an illegal boat at it, you can do that. Several communities have already done it. And it's a good way to get the record set straight. Moselli, when they're, they, we were just at their presentation, the only boats that are gonna be at those docks are gonna be the boats that are owned by the people that are buying those, those apartments or owning that property, renting that property, excuse me, their apartments. So I would just say, go forth with the, your ordinance. Lead, lead by example, and maybe the township will follow along because we only have one, one lake and we split the difference, you know, with, with respect to the village and the township, but lead by example. I would applaud you guys to, to move forward on that because we do need some leadership, guidance, and regulation. So, and Jerry, did you have a question for me? Okay, Ken. Do you recall any communities Did the Michigan Lakes and Streams Association write the ordinance? They have several that you can look at. But do you remember any of the communities that they worked with? No, but it's easy to find out. All you gotta do is go to the Michigan Lakes and Streams yeah. website and you can talk to the vice president and he'll point the way for you. So, and of course you're gonna have to tailor them for your own community, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel as Jerry was saying, so. Thank you, sir. Thank you, appreciate, appreciate the question. Thank you. I still have a question. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Jerry. Sorry. Um, the uh, representative from the DNR have they been actively enforcing the lake every so long? 
What he told us at our public, or excuse me, at our general membership meeting, if a citizen wants to provide him information as to the address of the, where they believe the boats are being rented, he will take that information and he will look at it and he'll look for the MC numbers for that property. And he has, he told us, was it seven days? Seven days, he has seven days to do, excuse me, do that review. And uh, at the end of the review, you may not get feedback, but at least uh, you, you might see some action on it. Now, there's one conservation officer for all of Oakland County. And guess whose lake is number one for complaints? It isn't Wild Lake, it's Lake Orion. So. Is a case by case complaint based response for the DNR? Yes, the DNR will come out. Yep. Right. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate the fact that this question came up because we're hearing about it all the time out there. We've given our attorney and our manager enough information. We already agreed to have this, I don't know, we need to draw discussion next council meeting, but let's let them get forward and do some of the work and discovery and see what we can put together. One quick question on the drawdown. Yes, I understand that you uh, got some DNR information tonight. We did. We uh, would like to have a copy. Have it, can that be shared with uh, Lake Orion Lake Association? Absolutely, Mr. O'Neill, we'd be glad to do that. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate Mr. it. I would like, based on our conversation this evening, it appears clear to me that the uh, issue is a legal one. So I move that we direct the village attorney to prepare a report on what authority we may have to regulate these various questions and present that to the village manager uh, who may then prepare a report or advisory direction for the board. Support. Any comments? Just really quick, there's a lot of moving parts here, a lot of questions. It might, I might find a real quick answer in state law that says, sorry, you're preempted. But aside from that, because there was a lot of ancillary issues raised or concerns, give me some time, please. <laughs> it may not happen this voting season, put it that way. And with the process of drafting up possible ordinance, it certainly won't happen this voting season. But be patient. We'll get to it, I promise. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Tom Patterson. I live at 65 North North Shore. And uh, one thing that I would like to say to people is in June of this year, Lola had its general membership meeting, uh, which was well attended for what it is. But uh, anyway, we did have the uh, Lake Orient Village police there as well as uh, uh, the county sheriff and the DNR there. If anybody is concerned about this, please join Lola. Uh, you can do it at lola.com. It's $20 a year. We do have an annual meeting every year, and uh, a lot of these questions could be answered there. Uh, we didn't have the amount of people to ask the questions that were asked here today. Uh, but we gathered an awful lot of information over the past, and I would suggest people Get involved through that because it's a, it's a great way to go on it. And, and also, may I suggest that we have microphones here, and I'll, okay, a lot we can't hear back there. So, thank you. I, I appreciate what everybody does here. Thank you. We were talking just a few minutes ago with Sarah talking about taking water in for waiting down a boat. Is that is called ballast. 
and that's used on freighters and things of that nature, which they do for waiting purposes. I think it would be easy enough to write an ordinance that it would be illegal to take on ballast on an inland lake, which would then neglect the, or negate the ability to take in hundreds, if not thousands, of gallons of water to wait on a boat. Thanks. You're not limiting the type of boat. You're limiting what they can do with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Close discussion. We have a motion on the floor. We have support. And I would like to do roll call. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Van Portley? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Luxinger? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Moving on to item 6, draw down discussion, directions, and Mr. Lamb. Sorry to be so, this is, this is all, we've all talked about this forever, so I just am trying to summarize and get some there. So, but read. the issues with the drawdown are A, who owns and controls the dam? B, who owns and controls the drawdown structure that runs under Oak Soda? And what authority do we have to operate that structure? Jerry. 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 Third, who controls owns and operates the, the cold water intake structure cold water drawdown to two. So these are relevant issues. I've read numerous documents, letters, agreements with the MDOT, et cetera, et cetera. I'd really like to get a definitive answer from our attorney about that. Based on those relevant facts, we should be able to make a decision as to whether we want to, once we know if we control the facility, then the, the next question I have, what authority do we have to raise and lower the lake level? I mean, we, we control the dam. The dam is the regulatory equipment. So these are questions that are legal questions. And I know that there's precedent, past practice, and desire, but I, I think we should <coughs> request you know, get this stuff cleaned up. There's enough documents, I believe, in our files to answer all those questions clearly. And once we understand this, we could then make a plan and decide what to do with the lake. And I think there's a technical component of it, too. And it's just uh, how many cubic feet per minute can the drawdown to generate uh, some type of in what period of time the speculation. Um, I'm not saying that's necessary to this portion right now because the responsibility and the authorization of who has what and who can use what is not even important. But if we do look for an alternative method, we need to understand that as well. We can't speculate that a 16-inch tool gives us six inches in six days. That doesn't have any better information than that. On a 475 acre lake, that's spread about six other lakes plus three. That's much. Um, another point to look at is the existing um, condition of the garage on construction. Um, a few years back, but when I was acting the village manager, I thought, all the years that I've been copying out here, I've never looked inside that shed. I'm going to go in the um, It was like something from a bell that goes over me. So, I mean, the existing structure, its uh, reliability, um, and, and the other aspect of this is when we had the uh, spillway damage to our dam, um, we discovered uh, kind of an error in the agreement we had with DNR dam um, and uh, it's, it's over M24, it's a state highway, and there's a dam under it. And uh, so there was a considerable amount of legal posture in the debate that went on for about three or four million dollars a year that we made it uh, So we developed a new agreement with NDOT and our on their, what, what 
that are responsible for our patients. Uh, and I believe there is a caveat for this structure as well with MDAT and the MDAT. So if there's an existing agreement as to who is responsible for it, who's maintenance of it, um, hopefully it's a street file, but not such that a small example would be some residents have complained about the tree growth on the west side of M24. My understanding is, is that embankment is a portion of the dam that is to be maintained and stay clear of growth by the owner. And I believe that may be done better. Well. Is that the, the section that's right by Ickery, the corner of Greens Park right there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most of that tree growth is an invasive species, so I wonder if there could be help from Sisma um, because we've dealt that along our property. It's an invasive tree that's extremely hard to kill um, because you have to do a broad treatment on everything because it sends out root suckers that are coming up into the volleyball court too. So um, that's something to look at. See, I do So I'd suggest that we did it similar to what we did in the last case and that's to direct the board to turn to do the investigation of the point of matter that we brought up and bring it back to us so that we can move forward with some type of a uh, plan. But we need to have this done quickly. Uh, I'm talking about this drawdown, correct? And we need to make a determination if we need to proceed this year or not. We need it on the next agenda item with whatever data we can use for that at that time. We will, Mr. President, we will gather as much information as we can. And uh, again, you've uh, filled our plate and we will get what we can as fast as we can. And uh, I know what, we know what you So what you stay want. with the drawdown and then um, the maintenance and the the consideration can be an additional, but that's all good discussion for uh, Our village uh, engineer, more like across, are fully competent hydraulic engineers and they're experienced with all the major software and modeling programs hired them before and many, many years ago. And uh, I'm also a great engineer and uh, they're quite happy. So we have everybody really right here in house already to make these uh, decisions for us. Okay, so I'm going to motion for any further discussion. Mr. Stevens, sir. Mr. Narsh, I uh, presented a case that the gate valve is in significant difficulty. I'm wondering, have we had an engineer take a look at that to determine whether it is? Because that's not just a drawdown issue. If that thing fails, we have a four-foot loss of water that's going to go downstream immediately. So there's a safety issue as to whether that is really a Bella Lugosi thing or if it is really functional and does it have a life expectancy? And to answer that, um, I didn't just see in the chat, um, I do believe we had an engineer, our engineers at the time, take a peek at that and they found it structurally safe. We actually gave it's a concrete slab, um, but the internal work is um, our The recommendation was that we use tension. And that was approximately three years ago. Okay. And we have it in our space. Well, it, it, if it is a case of rust in a gate valve and that, that is a problem. And it needs to be stepped forward to one of those other wonderful issues that we need money for. Right. And that's part of, I think, the discussion on whether we can drive. And that's also part of the discussion on who owns what. Right. So, Point. 
Uh, Jerry Richards, 535 Indian Wood. Um, my hearing isn't what it used to be, and it's very difficult to hear the conversations, but I just want to say there is an operating agreement with the village. It was signed in 1991, and it was between the village and the DNR for the deep draw tube. I have provided copies of this agreement over the years because every time this comes up, or every time we're losing our inventory of water on the lake, there's always a question about who actually owns the deep draw tube. In 1991, it was turned over to the village to operate it. Now, I know in recent years, the DNR has come out and helped out on that issue. So I can provide as many copies as you like, but it was signed, it's a legal document, and I can, uh, unless you have it, Wes has it, he can provide copies as well. Um, if, if Wes has misplaced it, I'll provide more copies, so thank you. Uh, secondly, um, as far as the mechanics of drawing down the lake, we can drop the lake one foot very easily at the dam by turning the one foot blocks 90 degrees and that'll take, down, take the lake down one foot. I understand the concern of the individual that owns the building that the old structure flows through. I understand that completely. But we got a 30 inch pipe over there for the deep draw. Maybe we could take some of the burden off the, of the, the way we did it in the past by maybe throttling with our draw tube or not even using that and do an engineering study to see if we can drop the lake with a 30 inch draw tube. That's a big tube. That handles a lot of water. So, and it's all cold water. It's not the warm water. And that's what we've been sending down the creek with the old structure that's over there in the south corner of Pelton's Point. So I just leave those thoughts with you and I hope that something comes of it because I think earlier this evening you were presented with some data that clearly supports the fact that the people want it. Statistically, the people want this to happen. So I leave you with that thought. Thank you. All right, I have a motion before us. Support. Yes, sir. Sorry about that, real quick. Jason Peltier, Oat Soda. Um, I'm only saying this because it's come to my attention several times by guests coming into Oat Soda that we as Oat Soda are responsible for the not doing the drawdown. Um, we are not. So Mr. Lamb mentioned the name Oat Soda, so I just want on the record that Oat Soda has nothing to do with no drawdown this year. So that's all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to close the session. We're going to go to the vote. And a motion to support the support. I'm going to ask the roll call again, please. What? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes? Yes. Thank you. It's hard to hear it off the mic. <laughs> Lamb? Yes. Luxinger? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Van Portley? Yes. Motion carry 7 0. Thank you. Good discussion. Thank you, everyone. We're going to move on to the, that concludes our agenda items. We do have an opportunity to call the public for non agenda items. I'll open that and we're going to have to do the right to move forward. Yep. I believe we all believe in a democratic process and the vote. That's very important and critical in our society. I have prepared a ballot, not a ballot, but a petition for the November election. And I would like to present it to you, the council, who are all believers in our democratic process, hoping that you will all sign that petition with regard to the TIF. Thank you. Thank you. Both the public. Move on to council comments. Nothing tonight, thank you. I don't have anything today. Yes. Uh, Two patch jobs on Jackson Street. I saw that one was done. Are you coming down to do the other one soon? We, our, our 
asphalt contractors are going to uh -huh. be doing it when they're in the area. It's such a small, it's like four by six foot, so they're not going to make a special trip for it. But when they're in the area, and it's hopefully soon, I'll get on them. Um, it's going to be done professionally because we don't have a roller. Okay, is if that we do it? It's going to look kind of. Is that in the near future? Or? Yeah, yeah, very, very near. Okay, because I was going to, you know, that one. It surprised me. It was done today. So when, when did you do that? The the guys did this the the one uh, Friday. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Mr. Lyon. I have so many comments. The, um, so tonight I went to a presentation at the Bocce Ball Club by the Jerry Corporation. There were quite a few people there. It was a public invite uh, for them to uh, present their new projects at downtown. Numerous of my neighbors have asked questions about these projects, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. I'm happy to report to you all that they've redone the parking lots and entrances to the satisfaction of MDOT and I believe to some great improvement uh, to the community. So I'm very pleased to see that. And also I was able to get some uh, really good snacks for once before eating the getting to the council meeting, but we're starving tonight at the end of the talk. So with that, um, finally, the project's coming along nicely. I'm still deeply concerned about the DBA capture of all of the $80 million in tax revenue, and I'm concerned about the tax abatements, so we can't pay for the dam repairs, the road repairs, and the water repairs, the sewer repairs. So I'm hoping that uh, Mr. Stevens' petition uh, gets before the voters in the fall. And I'd be happy to sign that petition. And, uh, or I hope that some uh, effort comes from you know, this joint committee that we form, uh, to help alleviate some of the financial burdens. So Mr. O'Neill and I met with the engineers this past Friday. Um, we meet with her every other Friday to go over a lot of the issues that you guys have and, and the, the citizens have. Um, this came up. Uh, originally they were having a hard time, so that bridge came in two sections, well actually three sections, but two are joined. Um, they were having a hard time finding an, an engineer to sign off on the piece that we want to put over the Meeks Park section because it was stick built and not manufactured with a tag like the other piece. She has since found an engineer to sign off on it and she's working with them and it should be coming along. Uh, uh, I first want to give my condolences to Reserve Sergeant Guy Higgins' family and his department. Thank you for that speech. It's, it's nice to, to hear employers uh, speak so highly of their colleagues. Um, also, just to put something else on your uh, plate, Mr. O'Neill, uh, just we, we've talked about this before. Um, the applications for events in our community. Uh, we've asked to have the update, or I believe Teresa has asked to have the website updated so it says in big bold letters, please submit 90 days, 120 days before. Um, so, you know, out of the four events that we approved, uh, one doesn't have an issue. The other three have issues. So anyway, if we could get something on the website soon and get the, um, these applications submitted earlier, that'd be great. 
That's all I have for tonight. Thank you. I wish to disregard the powers of the appreciation of that for the ones who run the bar here at the village hall. Is it, is it Wednesday? Wednesday. Wednesday? Wednesday. I'm sorry, Wednesday. It's your car. It is Wednesday. Today is Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I attended the uh, presentation event seen by the development of Sherry. And I wish to thank them because we continue to uh, make efforts to inform the public stay so far. Uh, I'm meeting a lot of people. Um, uh, I'm try to, I try to get out with Wes at least once a week, if not twice a week. And um, we're gaining on it. Oh, I can tell you. Lots to do. Good. Thank you very much. Is that it, sir? That's it. So moved. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 A